Hi everyone, in this tutorial I'm going to show you how to paint a horse in acrylics. Now the first thing that I like to do is start off with the eye and as you can see here I'm just using a small round brush to map in my main lights and darks. My main priority to start with is just to get the size and shape of the eye accurate. So I'll use just Mars Black to get that outline, the darkest part of the eyelid in place and then I can map in the structures around it. Now throughout this it's going to be very much about a layering process so I want to be working with a good base foundation and then building up my layers from there. Now as I start to work on the hair on the face I'm using a bit more of a larger round brush to map in the base layer a little bit more quickly but you can see that I'm still blocking in those main lights and darks. I haven't come in with one solid colour and then working from there. Now the reason I don't like to work that way is just because I feel that I'm more likely to skip through important layers. If I can map in my main lights and darks first, I'm already more likely to follow that reference photo accurately. So as I then continue to layer and add in my details, I'm already used to studying that reference photo. Now no matter what animal that I'm painting, I like to get my base foundation to a similar standard to what I've got here. So you can see that my values, the lights and the darks, they're seamless from one transition to the next. I don't have any harsh start and stop points. And as I say, it doesn't matter if it's a tiger, a dog or a cat, I will always be making sure that I've got that base foundation nice and smooth and well blended. Now in order to get that, you do have to work with a couple of layers. It's tricky to get that established on that very first layer because quite often your background colour is going to show through to some degree. So you do want to wait for that first layer to dry and then work with a second layer just to really perfect and refine that. Now when I start to build up the layers from there, this is where I'm going to again be more accurate with my highlights and shadows. So I'm using a combination of different brushes here to achieve slightly different textures but I'm always paying attention to where those lights and darks should be. Now the highlights and shadows, they're not random, they do follow the underlying bone and muscular structure. Now because horses have um, not much um, hair or fur on their face, it's significantly thinner, you are going to be able to see that structure underneath the skin more so than on a dog or a cat. So this is where you're going to have more of a pronounced cheekbone, the jaw bones and so on. So you really do want to be making sure that the highlights and shadows are accurate because they do follow those main structures under the skin. If the highlights and shadows are not quite in the right place, then you will then change the shape of that animal's face completely. And of course, if you're working with pet portraits, it's then not going to resemble that person's pet as much as it should. Now, I like to work in small sections and although the left side of the face is not complete, it's not finished yet, it's about 80% done. So once I've got to that standard, I then feel I'm able to work on the next part and then slowly piece the puzzle together. So I'm now going to use the same layering process that I've shown on the left side of the face. But one thing I want to mention is the importance of the fur or hair direction. Now the brush technique relies on three things. We've got fur direction, fur length and fur thickness. I have a video here on YouTube. It's my top tips for painting realistic fur. I'll link that in the description below if it's of interest. But there I do talk about those three main factors. Now just like the position of the highlights and shadows that I've already mentioned, the fur or hair direction is not random. That follows the underlying bone and muscular structure as well. So if I want to be making sure to replicate the shape of that face accurately, then the brush needs to be moved in the way to follow that fur or hair structure. So you can see here as it curves over the top of the eye socket. If I make my brush strokes here too flat or too straight, then I'm going to make the face look far wider. It's going to have more of a two dimensional and flatter feel. So any areas where you've got a slight curve, it is important to add that, even if you've only got space to add one or two brush strokes. Now, of course, the larger the painting, the more space we have to add all of those additional details. This was only a 10 by 12, so it's not really small, but it's not massive either. I did need to be realistic with how much detail I could include. Now that being said, this painting when finished, it does reach a high level of photorealism and that's because I focused on my values, the contrast and making sure to not add too many harsh details. Now this is something that I think we're all potentially a little bit guilty of where we're getting a bit too focused on that one layer. We start to create longer, more exaggerated brush strokes and what can happen there is the fur can end up taking on more of a textured appearance or you will end up just forcing too many details. Now if that happens when painting horses, you're going to end up with more of a fluffier texture to that hair 
And of course, with this, this horse did have significantly shorter hair on the face, being that it's in that summer coat. So I wanted to be making sure that I really did focus not only on the fur direction and how I'm moving that brush, but also the length of those brush strokes as well. Now, when painting white fur or white hair, the importance of values is crucial. If I was to just put down a solid layer of titanium white, then it's going to look very flat. So actually here, I'm darkening this up deliberately so that when I come back in with my details, they're going to be bright enough because the layer underneath is slightly darker. Now, I also want to be making sure that I've got the softness right where the white hairs overlap onto the brown sections of the hair. So this is where I really do want to be focusing on the brush technique, the fur length, the fur thickness and fur direction. Now the thickness of our brush strokes is going to be determined by a couple of factors, one of which is how much pressure is applied to the brush. So even if you've got a really fine narrow brush and you're looking to create those tiny details, if too much pressure is applied that line is going to be thicker. It doesn't matter what brush we're using, it could be a round brush, a liner brush or a filbert brush, any of those have the potential to create a broad range of brush strokes depending on the pressure that's applied. Now the other thing that also is a factor is the paint versus water consistency. So if you have your paint loaded on your brush and you've got too much of a thicker amount of paint on the end of that brush, it's going to be harder to create a finer line. That brush stroke is going to naturally have more of that thicker appearance to it. So getting that right balance between how to use the brush and how much paint versus water should be used is going to make that brush work to its best potential. Now any of my real time tutorials on Patreon and this horse tutorial is available now on Patreon from start to finish, no sections are sped up or cut out and I think that's really important especially when coming across issues or mistakes. Now I felt like this area, this tiny section of the white on the left hand side could have been made more refined, I felt like my brush strokes were not quite as delicate as I wanted. So in the end I just ended up painting over that section and starting again. And this is something that, as I've said, I would always include in my real-time step-by-step tutorials on Patreon because knowing how to fix mistakes is what makes us better artists. Nothing's been ruined, we just have to take that time and know the processes involved to get that end result that we can envision in our mind. Now there might just be that it's not quite the right brush stroke, maybe the base layer is not quite dark enough, whatever it may be, the time taken to fix that is always well spent. It's never time that's wasted. Now a question that I'm asked fairly frequently is how to overcome that fear of making mistakes. Now this is a great question and I think that it's normal to feel a bit daunted by that prospect. But the best way to look at that is mistakes make us better artists because when we learn how to fix that mistake, it helps us to then improve our painting skills. If that mistake was to happen again in another painting, we don't have to panic because we know how to fix it. The other way to look at it is by learning how to fix those mistakes, we are always improving those painting skills. So the next painting, we think, do you know what, last time I did this and I didn't quite like it, but I knew how to fix it, so I worked with this technique. You can then apply that right from the beginning on your next painting. So it's always a way that we can evolve and just get so much better with that medium, more confidence. And honestly, unless we put a hole through our canvas or spill something over the surface, anything can be fixed. Now when I painted the nose, the techniques that I used here were very similar to how I would paint skin of a person. So you can see that I'm adding the paint and then I'm also blending and softening that paint before adding in any kind of detail. I really want to be making sure that I've got those blended layers correct first because that's going to help with that smooth, soft texture. Now something that I mention frequently throughout the real-time version of this tutorial on Patreon is the importance of taking breaks. Now the time-lapse versions give the impression that this was done all in one painting session and it really wasn't. It was split up over four days and the breaks that we take here are just as important as the actual time we spend painting. Because if we spend so long at that easel staring at that one section of that painting, we can end up becoming more blinded by what we're looking at in that reference photo. It can become harder, we start making more mistakes and we don't really replicate it as accurately as we would do if we were taking those regular times away from that painting. So it's very important to make sure that you're always giving your eyes that chance to refresh. Now when I worked on the ears here you can see again it's very much a layering process but look at how dark that base layer started at. 
I want to be making sure that I've got that sharp contrast. The light is not able to capture too much of the front of the ear, so I want to be making sure that I've got those values correct. That's also going to help to make the rest of the face appear lighter. Now if you have got a strong one-sided light source on a reference photo, it's really important to make sure to capture that. So you might have one ear that's a little bit lighter than the other. Really do study those values and pay attention to those lights and the darks. And also I think in some cases we can end up adding too many brush strokes to the inside of the horse's ears. You can see that for the centre there there's not any brush strokes at all. So this is one of those situations where less is more. Now when working on the forelock, I've got a couple of little videos here on YouTube that show horse paintings where I'm using a similar technique. I'm really focusing on the clumps of the hair first. So I'm really focusing on getting the shadows in place. You saw here a couple of times I've come back in and darkened that layer because that's going to help to make the highlights appear brighter. Now if the base layers underneath aren't dark enough, the details that you're adding on top will look muted. So it's something to pay very close attention to. If the mixture that you've created you feel is right but it's not showing up, that is an indication that the base layer you're working from needs to be darkened. Now one of the very last elements on this painting was of course the neck and the mane. And this area was a little bit more out of focus, more softer looking. So I'm working on a significantly larger area so that I can blend my brush strokes together. In the real time tutorial this is the one area where we really do focus on lots of wet on wet blending techniques. Now, this is a great way of working with acrylics where you can get those soft transitions from one colour to the next because you don't allow the paint to dry. If you start to let that paint dry and it gets a bit tacky you're going to have issues with that paint looking blended and you'll have more star and stop points. So if that's something that you would like to see thoroughly in a real time tutorial then this would be perfect for that. And as I've said, my Patreon is all linked in the description below. Now while I'm waiting for the neck to dry, because that layer of paint was very thick, I was then working on adjusting some details on the face. I don't ever like to waste those opportunities. You can of course speed up your drying time with a hairdryer if you wanted to. But when you've got that area where you feel that you could move on, you could work on something else, then take that opportunity to do that. It does just help to break up that routine so we're not always working on that one section at one time. Now something that's really important when painting any animals is you want to be working on the right layer at the right time. So I had to paint the neck and chest area first because that's underneath the long sections of the mane. If I was to paint the mane first and then I work on the neck, I'm gonna to have to draw around all of those long, lovely brush strokes. So it's something that we need to be paying attention to and thinking in our minds, what should I be painting first? It really does save lots of time. And of course, as always, the very last element I like to add is the whiskers. They make a huge difference, but because they overlap everything else, you do want to add those last. So I really do hope that this video has been useful. If you are interested in painting along to the real time tutorial, then you do get the reference photo line art and full material list, all the paints, the colors and brushes that I used. But if this video was helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you could give it a like and a thumbs up because it makes a huge difference to my channel. I also upload a couple of videos to YouTube every week. So if you would like to get notified of that content, then don't forget to hit the subscribe and the bell button. If you've got any art related questions, feel free to pop them in the comments below because I'm more than happy to help if I can. And I'm going to be uploading another video next week. But as always, thank you so much for watching.